Hello everyone, welcome to PMF IS Current Affairs Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your test number 8 part 1 where we would be discussing the first 20 questions which are absolutely important for the upcoming prelims 2024. And so far if you have still not started your practicing MCQs, this is the most important topic guys. Last 60 days of the prelims are left and I highly recommend you to start practicing MCQs as many as you can. And here also, you can try our test series which is available at 499 with 1000 high quality MCQs. The link is in the description below. Do check it out. I'm sure you are going to get amazing results from this test series. The very first question of your test, number 8, which was with respect to Chalukyan dynasty. So this was a very important question on history and uh, definitely... Um, Many questions are expected from all the three, four parts of the history from ancient, modern, medieval and especially when it comes to the dynasties, they are absolutely important topic and a must, must prepare topic here. We are going to learn something about the Chalukyan dynasty. The four statements were given and you were supposed to figure out which statement is the correct one, right? So, if you first understand about the Chalukyan, first of all, please understand the context. Why suddenly? out of many dynasties. Why we are talking about the Chalukyan dynasty? So recently the two Badami Chalukyan temples, they were discovered, their inscriptions were discovered uh, uh, near, uh, near uh, the Krishna river in Telangana. So and these inscriptions are supposed to be somewhere around 1300 to 1500 year old and maybe one of them is around 1200 year old. So this context in itself can give you a good MCQ like you know uh, in which of the particular states we have recently got the Badami Chalukya temples inscriptions or those inscriptions were found near which particular river even that can be asked right now if you look at if you want to learn from the Chalukya dynasty first of all you need to look at the map on the map of India during uh, during the 6th, 6th century AD you will see the areas of this near Krishna river, you have the Chalukyas dynasty. And all these areas are the one which are under the influence of Badami Chalukyas. Why Badami? Because Badami is a place and it was the capital of the Chalukyas. That's why the name is Badami Chalukyas. Where exactly this dynasty? Now you have this into your mind and now you can relate to the question better. So it was, it was this almost the central Indian part where uh, and the peninsular part where you have the Chalukya dynasty at its peak. Now if you look at the question, few things you need to learn about this dynasty. First of all, the founder. It was Pulakesin I who established the Chalukyan dynasty around 550 AD. And Badami was the capital. Badami also used to be called as Watapi. So if, if the question says Badami or Watapi, it is the same thing. The only difference is some local people used to call it Watapi. Pulakesin I in history is also known by few titles that he adopted, Vallabheswara and he performed the famous Ashwa Med and that is where he established his Chalukyan dynasty. Please understand you have, you have just seen on the map where the location of the, cent of the Chalukyan dynasty was, it was central Indian plateau. And from 6th to the 12th century, it was long span of 600 years where Chalukyan dynasty ruled the central Indian plateau of India, right? This is absolutely important. Remember the establisher was Pulakesin I, but when it comes to the most powerful, most, you know, able ruler of the dynasty, it was Pulakesin II, the son of the Pulakesin. And he is credited that he expanded his territory to the large extent. And it was Pulakesin II, who got in fight with the Harsh Vardhan of Kanauj, where the very famous battle uh, uh, took place on the banks of river Narmada. And as per the Ravi Kirti's Ahiol inscription, very, very famous inscription, this inscription speaks the story how Pulakesin II got its victory over Harsh Vardhan. And after his victory over Harsh Vardhan, Pulakesin II assume the title of Parameshwara that is the supreme lord because Harshwardhan was the legend of his times. Okay, this is very important point. And this Badami, Badami Chalukya dynasty 
after polar casein 2's death there was a steep decline because like i told you it was polar casein 2 who was the supreme leader of that particular era and after the decline of the chalukyas they were replaced by rashtrakutas this again is very important because many times the question uh, the chronology of the dynasties are important like which dynasty followed the other one so it was the rashtrakutas that replaced the chalukya the chalukya dynasty and uh, in rashtrakutas you have the very famous uh, uh, you know the ruler danti durg who finally defeated the kirti varman 2 of chalukyas and finally the chalukyans totally disappeared please remember even a very famous chinese traveler i'm sure you must have heard the name huan sang huan sang he came to india during the courts of polar casein 2 so everything you need to learn about polar casein 2 this figure in history absolute deserves a lot of questions on him individually so do prepare them well for your exam now if you look at the question the question everything is perfect uh, only the problem is with the second statement guys we just have understood and discussed the ahiol inscription is about the victory of polar casein 2 not the polar casein 1 so that this one statement is wrong rest all the three statements are correct so this question i would say it was a very straightforward question easy uh, i can't say but yeah kind of medium level question answer is going to be c you can easily attempt this question because it's a standard question very very standard question on the chalukyan dynasty so i do not think any problem uh, into that and let me tell let me tell you one very interesting fact here just to understand this one thing you take any dynasty you take literally any dynasty of the history usually the founders are not that famous or not uh, that you know into the power regimes mostly the second generation or the third generations are the rulers which have actually assumed the peak of their dynasties it's very common you take you take mughals for example it was akbar who actually raised to fame you take the the mauryans it was the ashoka the third one who actually got to the fame so normally it's a very general trend the founders are majorly not the the one that that are going to be extremely powerful because those founders have already uh, you know spent their life in fighting a lot of other things and uh, it, it's mainly the second and third generation that actually rises to the fame so if you apply that kind of logic you see why polar casein 2 looks more logical not polar casein 1 uh, defeating somebody of the stature of harsha right so in this category could have gotten it easily guys now comes to the question number two the second question that we have is with respect to pineapple express very interesting question very straight away question what this pineapple express is all about this term occasionally sometimes in news what is a pineapple express is it a monsoon depression no sir is it a seasonal wind pattern no not at all it's not even a cyclone then pineapple express is what it is an atmospheric river originating in the pacific near the hawaii and the term is called pineapple express why is it called so i'll tell you in a while guys so right answer here is b that is the right answer well uh, it's a medium level question because in news you must have heard about the atmospheric river especially in the case of united states of america in the northern america there you have lots of questions and the news coming on the atmospheric river so in this particular question let's say you have absolutely no clue you have definitely no clue that you can you have to skip because you, you there is no way you can guess this up if you have little bit of understanding you can still take a risk but better to skip this kind of direct questions because they're absolutely there's no concept associated they are totally fact-based questions so be careful about rather than you know unnecessary making it wrong it's not it's not as why advisable to get it wrong altogether so what exactly this pineapple express and atmospheric rivers are let's understand pineapple express is nothing but a strong atmospheric river that originates in the tropical pacific near hawaii what exactly is the atmospheric river first this has to be your question well the term atmospheric river means a long a relatively narrow band of the water vapors that actually forms over the oceans and flows through the sky and transport moisture from the tropics to the northern latitudes so very particularly we use 
this word only for these kind of phenomena and we, we see these atmospheric rivers they are formed by the winds associated with the cyclones and they move under the influence of other wind patterns but what exactly they are in, in itself they are nothing but a band of water vapors you you must see this picture first before i discuss anything else look at this picture it will give you better clarity this is how the atmospheric river moves you can see this complete this is your atmospheric river why it is called atmospheric river because you have the consistency or the water vapor it looks like as if a river is flowing but they're actually the band of water vapors and wherever wherever they get a chance to rise up they always you they you are going to see lots of moisture falling as the water vapor cools you have the moisture coming down in the form of precipitation and it very commonly happens near california very very common phenomena we have uh, about the atmospheric rivers right okay sir so please try to keep that into the mind but but now the reason why it is called a pineapple river then sir the the reason calling it a pineapple is because it is named for the moisture trail extended to hawaii's pineapple region in hawaii hawaii is all famous for pineapples i'm sure you must know that even if you order a pizza hawaiian pizza you are going to have lots of pineapples so always relate pineapples with hawaii it's a very very uh, a very common thing that you you need to learn so uh, so because this you have this all atmospheric river and there is a moisture trail on the pineapple region that's why the name uh, is given as pineapple express so when the pineapple express when whenever it reaches the west coast brings intense rainfall uh, in california uh, even in a single day you can have as much as 5 inches of the rainfall so you can imagine the kind of impact we have with respect to the atmospheric rivers question number 3 is with respect to the martial arts and the states very common standard format of the upsc so here you have some of the martial arts and you have to figure out which are correctly matched so here are the four arts called silam silamba lathi khela kalaira pattu and mardani khel very very even this term khela you know this this is a bengali term so yes this statement is correct the word khela is mostly used in bengali so lati khela is right it is west bengal but other three are not right why let's try to understand that first so lo looking at um, but first of all look, please understand the context why we are talking about these martial arts because recently something very very important and unique happened in the indian army especially after the galwan violent clashes between india china you know that happened 2020 indian army decided that martial arts are going to be a part of regular training of the troops other than the normal uh, physical activities now the indian army is uh, giving the soldiers regular training in terms of martial arts and here you see the punjab regiment like that is their famous gatka it's a martial uh, dance martial art form so they have incorporated gatka the gorkha regiment started the the khukri dance the the weapon that khukri that they use madras regiments incorporated the kalare pattu which actually originally belongs to kerala and uh, this this is this is all happening even the udhampur based uh, has started martial uh, art called the karav maga which has an israeli origin so now this is absolutely important for you to know the martial arts and their belonging states so talking about the kalare pattu first it belongs to the state of kerala very very absolutely important you can see in the picture i need not to tell you anything else but you can see this is kalare pattu it's a it's a martial art technique it talks about the weapon training talks about physical conditioning the strikes the kicks and of course the healing techniques it's all about the connection of mind and body very ultimate and very very ancient one of the ancient martial arts that we have in india then you have the silamban silamban actually belongs to tamil nadu silamban actually refers to you know, you can see the fighters are fighting with a special type of bamboo stick because silamban actually refers to type of bamboo in, in tamil nadu it's a bamboo stick warfare and then you have a lathi khela that happens in west bengal it's a it's a stick fighting that that take place in west bengal another important martial art form and then you have another one called the mardani khel that belongs to maharashtra the states name are absolutely important guys 
so it was effectively used by chhatrapati shivaji maharaj to defeat the mughals and um, uh, now it's very very famous martial martial art forms of the marathas and uh, the name is mardani khel called in maharashtra and here are the names of some other traditional art forms that you can remember and and i always uh, requ uh, request you guys and i recommend to please read about such type of questions very very important when it comes to art and culture you have straight questions coming on these topics for example gatka i told you in punjab you have the masti yud in varanasi you have the thangta in manipur then you have called the square in kashmir the malakham in madhya pradesh now if you look at the question do you know what what's the wrong answers here so clearly the kalarepattu does not belong to tamil nadu it belongs to kerala and selamba belongs to tamil nadu the two are inter exchanged and the the fourth one is again wrong mardani khel belongs to the maharashtra not the up so yeah so here the right answer is a only one pair is correct talking about the level i would say the level was tough why it's a pure fact based question you have no choice of the guess work so risk it only you know it otherwise you need to skip because getting the wrong answers plus there is no elimination there is absolutely no scope of elimination here given the new format of the upsc you can't really eliminate the thing so that actually make the things more tough and difficult for the upsc aspirants going ahead with the question number 4 it talks about the rip current guys so this statement is about the rip current what is a rip current how it is formed and uh, something very interesting that you need to figure out so first let let's talk about the rip current and then we'll come back to the question so recently why we are talking about it first understand the context if you look at the context guys then recently isro along with the Inter indian national center for ocean information services called the incois and isro so these two bodies recently started a project the project is to monitor and issue the operational forecast alert with respect to the rip current and now you can understand why it is so important if you have a dedicated project to monitor rip current it must means something serious business right so rip current is actually in oceanography you will learn it learn more about it rip current is a narrow it's a powerful current of the water that runs perpendicular to the beach if this is your beach if this is your beach then you are going to have rip current like this it it, it is absolutely perpendicular on the beach and it typically extends near the shoreline through the surf zone why it is formed the the reason why a rip current is formed in a perpendicular way to the beach the the reason is the shape of that shoreline itself sometimes you have the shorelines in such a way where the the water is not going to get enough movement to to move parallelly and the water current has no choice but to act as a perpendicular rip current it is all because of the shoreline shape right and it is always going to be sudden always going to be unexpected and that's why they are dangerous that's why they are dangerous especially for those people who are uh, present near the beaches especially doing some water activities so it becomes really really tough and difficult for those people and that's why we are talking about something serious some dedicated projects about giving the forecast and warnings with respect to this so very important and you can see on the in the in this pic picture also guys you can see why this rip current is so uh, dangerous so here is the here is the deal of the rip current you can see this is your beach and this is exactly the perpendicular how it is moving and especially dangerous for these people it can actually push the people into the deeper waters and you have very less scope of people getting escape so um that's why the rip currents are really dangerous now if you look at the question everything is fine but there is one problem with the question and that is the first basic definition of a rip current a rip current is narrow it is powerful but is it running parallel no sir if it would have been running parallel there would not be any problem the problem it it runs perpendicular it runs perpendicular and that is why that is why we have to talk about it so this first statement sir is not correct look at the options there is only one option that says 
that the statement 1 is incorrect. So by default your answer is supposed to be D. Because there is only one choice which states statement 1 is incorrect. If statement 2 is correct, of course it will be as the, as the option says. And it is correct. You just have learned the rip currents are because of the shape of the shorelines. And they are sudden and unexpected. So answer is supposed to be D. What about the question level? That's a medium level question. You could have attempted it very easily by simply understanding the rip current and if it is parallel or if it is a perpendicular one. Straight away, there's it's a concept based question. Very important topic of the oceanography which I, I think everybody reads about. Next question is going to take back you to the history because we are going to discuss about the Dayanand Saraswati. Very important and tall figure when it comes to the history of India, the modern India you have the name of the Aaron Saraswati. So what exactly we are we are supposed to talk about him? Let's let's try to learn few facts about the Aaron Saraswati then we'll come back to the question. Talking about the Aaron Saraswati, I, I, think, I think we all have read about him a lot, we all have heard about him a lot. Talking about the Aaron Saraswati guys, he was born in Gujarat. His real name was Mool Shankar and later he became the Aaron Saraswati. He was a person who believed in the theory of karma and reincarnation but he is all famous for the way he endured Vedic notions. For the way he subscribed to the Vedic notions, he gave the very famous, uh, uh, you know, famous statement of go back to the Vedas. So he was, he was a strong believer of Vedas. He, he strongly used to believe in the Chatur Varn system, the four Varns of the time, the Brahmin, the Kshatriyas. Vaishyas and Shudra. So he believed in karmas, he believed in reincarnation, he was a staunch follower of the Vedic notions, gave this famous slogan, go back to Vedas. But, but and, and we all know him for the Arya Samaj that he founded and he is very famous for that, right? In fact, all the DAV schools that we have belongs to Dayanand Saraswati, right? Now the point here is that before he started Arya Samaj, he also started with which very less people know. He also started the Paropkarani Sabha, very, which he started in Ajmer uh, uh, way back in 1882. Right? This is absolutely important. Now, before founding uh, this uh, Paropkarani Sabha, uh, he started and he got famous in 1875 when he founded the Arya Samaj. After Arya Samaj, he got into more and more into the Vedic text works and all and to promote, to publish and preach about the Vedic text more, he started the Parokkarni Sabha. So chronologically, Arya Samaj first, then you have the Parokkarni Sabha. Okay? Very interesting. Dan Saraswati is a person who is credited to have first used the term Swaraj, the self-rule, which definitely later on picked by many of the revolutionaries of India including the Lok Manya Tilak and Mahatma Gandhi but the original first time the, the word Swaraj, the self-rule was used by Dayanand Saraswati where, where he meant by Swaraj was India for the Indians. Nobody else is going to come here and rule. That was his ideology. He was against the idol worship. He never ever believed in any idol uh, worship. He was also against the caste system, not the word system. Please understand the two things are different. He believed in the word system, but he was against the caste system. He was against the ritualism, the fat, the fatalism, infanticide, sale of the grooms, the child marriages, like all the social evils, all the kind of social evils which were present there. He was staunch, staunchly against those kind of practices. And he is very rightly called the maker of modern India. But who gave him the, that term? It was Sarvpalli Radha Krishna, India's second president also, uh, who called Dayanand Saraswati as the maker of modern India. And let me tell you, Dayanand Saraswati also wrote the three famous books. And these are the Satyarth Prakash, the Ved Bhasha Bhumika and the Ved Bhasha. All the three texts belongs to Dayanand Saraswati, which itself can be a MCQ anytime. So if you look at the question, everything is fine, everything is perfect. The only problem is with the statement number, statement number 4, you can see. So we have just understood, it was not Sardar Vallabhai, but Sarvrada uh, Palli Krishna. He called him the modern uh, maker of modern India, 
not Sardar Vallabh Bhai Patel. So except the uh, statement number 4, the first 3 are absolutely correct guys. So answer is supposed to be only 3. Medium level question because Daran Saraswati is very very famous figure. So I think everybody could have attempted it very very easily. In case you have little bit doubt, you can still take a risk because Daran Saraswati is a well known figure and well read figure in history. I don't see any problem coming with any student guys. The next question is very simple, very easy and very very interesting. In climatology, you, heard, you must have heard about the El Nino and the La Nina. This question is with respect to the La Nina, which is considered to be the normalizing phase of the El Nino. Whatever goes wrong in El Nino, the things get corrected in the La Nina figure. So first let's talk about La Nina and um, we know a little and here, here one thing very interesting without even reading about it. So tell me one thing guys, are you aware that all these El Nino and the La Nina both of these you know um, atmospheric oceanic interactions that we have, both of them they are part of Pacific Ocean. It's a well known fact. El Nino and La Nina both are going to occur in Pacific Ocean. Look at the first statement it says, La Nina are the cyclical phase. Why cyclical? Because every El Nino followed by La Nina, every La Nina followed by El Nino. That's a cyclic process. It says it is an equatorial Atlantic Ocean current. No sir, Atlantic Ocean has nothing to do with La Nina and we know that. El Nino, La Nina both belongs to the Pacific Ocean has nothing to do with any other thing. Yes, it is a cooler, cooler phase, the cooler than normal phase, but it's not in Atlantic, it is in Pacific. That makes my statement number one wrong. Very simple, basic understanding. And thankfully, by eliminating it, I'm able to get my answer. This is the way you can solve it by elimination technique. Only by eliminating option one, you have got the answer, which is that means two and three are absolutely correct. La Nina, in La Nina, the winds over the ocean, equatorial Pacific are easterlies. The question itself says, look at this, look at this, the, the question itself says in second line, La Nina has, belongs to the equatorial Pacific. So how can it, be, how can it belong to equatorial Atlantic? So clearly the two statements are contradictory. Two can't be true at the same time, right guys? And the third says the El Nino is responsible for the transportation of the pollutants from North India to the Peninsular India. Now this much, this is a statement that you need to learn something in detail. But the first and second are absolutely correct. So this question, I would say very easy, easy to attempt because thanks to elimination, you can get the answer very, very easily. Now let's learn something about that. I have just mentioned that the pollutions are transported from North India to the Peninsular India by the La Nina phase. How and why? See, in the La Nina phase, we have seen that it is the easterly winds which are into the action. Easterly winds from the Pacific and the northeasterlies from the Bay of Bengal. When these two winds, they appear to accelerate the northwesterly flow from North India and that every flow converges somewhere in the Indian Peninsula region. That is why it seems that the trans that the pollutant all the pollutants of North India they are actually shifted downwards towards the peninsular India because of the convergence of the easterlies and the northeasterlies from the Bay of Bengal and that's why the transportation of the pollutants happen down south. So all the three statements are absolutely correct here guys. That brings us to the question number seven. Now what, what this question number seven says the question number seven is about it has something to do with the map also. It talks about 38 degree north, 38 parallel. We know it's a very, very famous uh, international boundary, which is between North Korea and South Korea, which is absolutely correct. 38 parallel is also called the demilitarized zone. The word is called demilitarized zone. But you know, you know the irony, the name is only demilitarized. In reality, this is the most militarized, the most heavily military guided international border between North and South Korea. Only the name is demilitarized zone, but in reality, this is the heaviest, heavily guarded military, military, uh, uh, you know, observed uh, international boundary that we have. But 
it has nothing to do with the Rotterdam conference. It was not the Rotterdam conference that chose it as a bifurcation border. Then what it was? Let's try to learn and then come back to the question. So first thing is first, it was actually the Potsdam conference. Potsdam conference 1945, nearly the end of the World War II, chose 38 degree line as the demarcating line between North Korea and South Korea. So the credit goes to this conference. You know, initially Japan used to occupy Korea somewhere uh, till 1945. From 1910 to 1945, the whole Korean peninsula was under Japan. Then the bifurcation of the Korean peninsula happened in 1945 at the Yalta conference. And after that, because after the defeat of Japan, um, it was the, the whole peninsula went to the Allied powers. And then Allied powers decided to bifurcate the Korean Peninsula as North Korea and South Korea. This decision was done in Yalta Conference, the breaking of the peninsula. But deciding the border happened in Portsdam Conference. And as a result, we have got this 38 degree line, 38 degree parallel as the demarcating line between North and South Korea. You can see it's a demilitarized zone here, but heavily guarded, heavily guarded with the military bases. Okay, so now if you look at the question guys, so clearly you have the op statement number one as correct, but statement two as incorrect. And look at the statement, there's only one option that says statement two is incorrect. So answer obviously has to be statement C. Question I would say, sir, you need to have, you need to be very good with the facts. Okay, this question was a tough one because it was heavily fact this question. You don't really have a choice of any guesswork. So take a risk if you, if you afford to or you need to skip the question unnecessarily getting into the wrong answer scenario. You don't really have to have a guesswork. Next question is pretty simple, pretty obvious and very easy I would say. The statement says which statement is not correct with respect to African Union and let me tell you, let me give you one hint here. You are definitely going to have questions on African Union. I would say it's a four star importance out of five. Why? Because recently in the G20, African Union is formally included as a part of G20. Became the second regional organization or a group to become a formal member of G20. And this happened under Indian leadership, Indian, Indian uh, chairmanship of G20. So 100% questions going to come on African Union. What is African Union as the name says? It's, about, it's, it's a body, it's a group of 55 countries, all countries of Africa unitedly represented as African Union. So please look at the first statement, how it can be intercontinental sir. Intercontinental means it is spread across two continents, no. African Union is about only one continent that is Africa. Very logical answer. So straight away, this is not right. And that's what it was asked. So answer, I got the first answer very first time. So African Union is continental body. Very easy question, very straight away could be attempted. It is continental body, right? Now if you, if you look, at the, look at the in general kind of uh, statements, you need to learn a little bit more about the African Union. So like I told you, it's a continental body, belongs to only one continent that is African continent and it has all 55 countries as a member. It was actually officially launched in 2002 because before that there used to be another organization called Organization of the African Unity which was there till 1999 but, uh, but then it was scrapped and African Union became the successor of that old treaty with its headquarter in Ethiopia's capital called Addis Ababa. And the African Union, it is the, it is like I told you, it's the most recent recipient of the full membership status of G20. Another membership uh, is called is European Union. So now when I say G20, it means 19 countries plus two unions called European Union and African Union. An absolutely important topic that you should prepare and it's very obvious. Why African Union would have been formulated? Think about it. It's very obvious objectives. Why any union is formed? to achieve greater unity, solidarity between the African countries and the people, to defend the sovereignty, territorial integrity, independence of the members, 
promote the democratic principles, promoting the institutions, popular participations, promoting peace, security, stability, and all the obvious questions like political, socio-economic integration. Very obvious kind of stuff, right? Now that brings us to the question number nine, which is about the International Solar Alliance (ISA). Very, very famous alliance. But and this this was uh, this was uh, launched uh, somewhere around 2015-2016. And that was clearly not the conference of party 23. I remember clearly it was conference of party 21. So that makes one at least number two as wrong. It is wrong. And uh, even the third statement looks very, very extreme. It says only tropical countries allowed to that. It is also wrong. I'll, I'll discuss why they are wrong. First, get, let me take you to the details of the ISA. So International Solar Alliance, something that India should be proud of. Why India should be proud of because this International Solar Alliance, it's a treaty based international organization. The treaty is all about the solar resources. The name says International Solar Alliance. So very obvious. It talks about that all the countries, all the countries which are fully or partially between the Tropic of the Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, like, like all the countries of the tropics partially fully, we want to align them together because solar energy has a huge potential and it was India and France these two countries brainchild was ISA where it was launched very simply to mobilize efforts against the climate change by deployment of solar energy solution replacing the fossils with the renewable especially with the solar that is the idea of ISA and it was during the conference of party 21 that happened in Paris, the very famous landmark deal of Paris climate deal that happened in 2015. So how can we forget that? Everything about COP21 is absolutely important that we must learn by heart. The vision is simple. Let's make together, let's, let us together make the sun brighter. Mission is simple. Every home, no matter how far away, will have a light at home. And the very interesting topic, a very interesting fact about the ISA is for the first time, you have an international treaty headquarters in India. The headquarters of the ISA, they are in Gurugram, National Institute of Solar Energy of India. United Nations General Assembly, UNGA, has been given an observer status of the ISA in 2021. Not originally. In 2021, it was given the status. Another thing, please understand, though the... the, the uh, the group says that the alliance is all about the tropical countries. But please understand, all UN members are eligible to be part of it. And that's why the, today there are more than 120 signatories. And we are not restricting the, any of the member. Anybody can be part. So countries even that do not fall within the tropics, they can still join the alliance. But there is one condition. If you are not a tropical country, you can join, no problem. But you will not get the voting rights. Voting rights are exclusively for the core members that are, that are the tropical countries. Because we talk about the tropical things, we talk about the sun here, the solar energy here. And you, you have learned that it is the tropics, it is the tropics only where you are going to get the direct sunlight. The maximum, the heat surplus zone. You must have heard the word called as the torrid zone, right? So we have the torrid zone as the, as, the te as the tropical zone where you have the maximum sunlight. And that's why that makes sense why the core members are tropical countries. Now please remember one very, very, very interesting strategy within this ISA. Within ISA, you have a strategy called towards 1000 strategy. And please do expect one standalone question coming on, the, on this as well. What is this towards 1000 strategy? It is, it means, here the word 1000 means lot. Please understand. One, towards 1000 strategy means mobilizing 1000 billion US dollars of investment in solar energy solution by 2030. It also means delivering energy access to 1000 million people using the clean energy solution. Also installing 1000 gigawatt of solar energy capacity and mitigating global solar emission to the tune of 1000 million tons of carbon dioxide every year and that's why it justifies because every target is about something 1000 and that's why the name is towards 1000 strategy but it is all under the umbrella of isa
right? You go to the question, guys. You go to the question. So you have you have already figured out the second and third are not correct because it says only tropical countries are eligible to join. No, sir. Anybody can join, but the voting rights to be given to the tropical countries only. First and th fourth are correct. Only how many are correct? Only two are correct. Level of the question, I would say it was a medium level question. You can you can definitely attempt it. At least take a risk because this is a very simple question. You do not have to worry about it at all. Uh, only some common sense like for example statement 3. Very obvious it's too extreme statement that can be eliminated. But I don't see any problem coming to you while attempting this question. The next one, the question number 10 is about the IBSA, very very famous group called about India, Brazil and South Africa. The name itself says India, Brazil, South Africa. So what, what, what we have to figure out, what statement is correct about the IBSA. Now it says, now there are four different different uh, uh, categories. So what is IBSA and what, what all we have to learn about the IBSA. It says it does not have any headquarter but as a permanent executive secretary, no sir. IBSA has no headquarter, no permanent executive secretariat. Each country contributes 10 million annually is also wrong. In IBSA contingency fund, every country only contributes 1 million annually, not 10 million. And please understand, IBSA was formed not on the side lines of the Gandhi Nagar Declaration. Gandhi Nagar Declaration is about rooftop. Solar, solar energy, it has nothing to do with IBSA. So here technically three are wrong. I am only left with one option which make every sense about the IBSA. The UN office for South-South Cooperation actually act as a secretariat and the fund manager of the IBSA because the first statement says it does not have any executive secretary. Very common sense, no? If some, th some other office is, uh, you know, is actually giving you space for your secretariat. Obviously, you don't have a permanent secretariat, right? So answer here with a very common sense, you can give the answer. Uh, the question was a medium level, level, but still something that you can take a little bit of risk because other statements are very obviously wrong. Very obviously wrong, I'm saying. Please learn something about the IBSA. So this particular group, IBSA group, it was actually formalized and named IBSA way back in 2003 by the Brasilia declaration because the three countries they met in Brasilia. Brasilia is a is the city we have in uh, Brazil right it's uh, so in Brasilia declaration we have got the and the question was said Gandhi Nagar declaration. Gandhi Nagar declaration has nothing to do with that. India contributes 1 million to IBSA because every country contributes 1 million to the IBSA poverty elevation fund remember. And this is a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, part. This uh, group, it's a this poverty elevation is a very uh, unique way to enhance South-South cooperation for the benefits of of the global South. Look at this. Look at this uh, uh, other statements. Like I told you, every country contributing one million only. This UN office for South-South cooperation is very important. In journal also, you may have a question coming on that as well, guys. Now, what is this UN Office for South-South Cooperation that actually act as a secretariat and fund manager of the IBSA? You need to learn about it. Talking about the UN Office for South-South Cooperation, it, it, it was created way back in 1974. The objective was to promote and coordinate the support of the South-South Cooperation. What is the South-South Cooperation? You must have heard about the term Global South, right? If, if on this map, if I have to make a line, you see, I would make a line like this. All the developed countries, all these developed area, developed countries are called the global, they are called the global north. All the developing and least developed uh, areas like South America, Africa, Asia, all of them are called as global south. So south-south cooperation means when the two countries of the global south, they are cooperating with each other. And there is another important word and, and it says Triangular cooperation. What is a triangular cooperation? Triangular cooperation means when the two South-South countries are doing some project and there is one global North, one developed country supporting their project. That is why the name is triangular cooperation. 
where two south south countries two global south members are actually assisted and held by some global north member that is called a triangular cooperation so that the two terms are very important guys for your exam so now that brings us to the question number 11 question 11 very factual question no scope for any guesswork it talks about guru ravidas ji very important figure and uh, you must learn a lot of things about him so talking about guru ravidas first first thing is first he was an indian mystics poetic saint and he was a saint during the bhakti movement the very famous uh, uh, movement that we witness in our country and he guru ravidas was a founder of the ravidasa religion also during some 15th or 16th century where the bhakti movement wa was at peak in the northern india he was born in varanasi and he was born into so called the lower caste of the time it was a leather workers family so even today lot of people from the lower caste they are still uh, worship ravidas as a god because for because he really stood stood for all the uh, peoples which were discriminated on the caste basis that time and still he is the source of information uh, source source of uh, you know uh, motivation uh, inspiration for a lot of people talking about guru ravidas he actually was into the formless god the nirgun bhakti where he used to uh, pray or worship the god not in any form but as a sense of belief in fact guru ravidas is also credited that he thought of a society he envisioned he he talk about a society that should be called as begampura means a city without grief it was an idea it was a concept only uh, where he he believed there has to be a city without any grief without any fever fear where he believed everyone should be equal and discrimination not to be tolerated at all of course this was the ideal city which i i do not think happens anywhere in fact something you need to know about guru ravidas he is considered to be the spiritual guru of meera bai who is the queen of chitor and we know about meera bai a lot uh, for for a uh, devotion to the bhakti movement the holy book the sikh holy book guru granth sahib the holy book in sikhism compiled by guru arjan dev the fifth guru of the sikh also contains 41 verses of guru ravidas so you can see the kind of respect even the sikh gurus had for guru ravidas and you look at the statements all the four statements are absolutely perfect absolutely fine answer is supposed to be t the question i would say it was a medium level guys since you have this elimination kind of options at least try to risk these kind of questions because you are going to see very few such kind of questions in this case you can attempt it you can take a risk because you still have the options of eliminating the options so yes it was an it was a very good question and very expected one as well next question is going to challenge your map knowledge because you are given the five countries iran iraq israel egypt syria and how many countries share a border with jordan jordan very much in news these days and that's why it it it, it explains why we asked you this kind of question because we are focusing on the places in news look at the jordan and look at the news related to that because recently we have seen a us military serviceman was killed in a drone attack in jordan and that's why it was in news for many many reasons right so talking about the jordan if you look at the map guys you have the four countries that borders jordan here you have the jordan in green color please do not forget to see that so on the on the south side you have the saudi arabia on the east side you have iraq on the north you have syria and then you have israel on the western side so the four countries are bordering the jordan area very interesting not lebanon please remove not even iran even iran is quite far away so iran is not touching the boundaries lebanon is not touching the boundaries and neither egypt is touching the boundaries because you have israel in between the jordan and egypt right so look at the options so clearly you have you, you have got your answer because i just mentioned iran is quite far away egypt is quite far away iraq yes sir israel and syria and the fourth one being saudi arabia but these are the three options so only three is the right answer that share the border with jordan in this question i always say they are tough question why tough question because you have to be 200% sure about the map 
you cannot do any guesswork sir it's a fact and purely fact based question so only attempt it if you know about it otherwise you have to skip take a risk when it is calculated because these are tough questions tough they are fact based questions right that brings us to another fact based question and a map based question where you are given the four canals and the straits we talk about the suez canal the strait of babel mandab the strait of gibraltar the ben gurion canal and you have to figure out how many of them are absolutely correct so again a, a question that that is going to challenge your knowledge of the maps so are you preparing your maps or not please do not take it lightly map based questions are going to be in the in the exam for sure now the question says about the suez canal we know about the suez canal right so suez canal is that artificial uh, uh, waterway that you can see here connecting mediterranean sea with the red sea absolutely no problem and it is it is digged uh, uh, in egypt uh, you know in the in the sinai peninsula so suez canal connects the mediterranean with the red sea yes sir talking about the bab al mandab you can see where is bab al mandab here is bab al mandab connecting the red sea and the gulf of aden it is one of the choke points that connects the two uh, points please remember the question says the persian gulf and it is not the right way persian gulf and the gulf of oman they are connected by with strait of hormuz you have the strait of hormuz connecting the two bab al mandab is connecting the the red sea and the gulf of aden also we know about the strait of gibraltar guys very famous strait uh which connects here is your atlantic sea so if you want to enter the mediterranean strait of gibraltar is the way that takes you to the mediterranean sea so it it connects the atlantic uh, uh with the mediterranean sea and talking about the ben gurion canal it is not a it is not something which is there already it's a proposed project and it was very much in news so do expect a question coming on the ben gurion canal project what is that guys so right now if you from the red sea we go to the gulf of suez and from there we have the suez canal that takes us to the mediterranean sea this is a conventional uh, trade trade method um, route that we have now given the susceptibility of the suez canal given the crisis that that suez canal is facing right now there is an alternative way also which is proposed rather going to gulf of suez you have to go to gulf of aqaba this water body is called the gulf of aqaba so go to gulf of aqaba from there make this canal that actually on the border of jordan israel and from israel you can go to the mediterranean sea so this is a proposed one not yet mobilized it's a proposed one which is seen as an alternative to the suez canal and that actually shifts the dynamics of the power and it is going to if that happens if that gets on to the on to the ground in reality then israel is going to be gaining a lot from this trade route and of course egypt is going to lose a lot of things and that actually going to increase the rivalry between the arab countries and israel further so you have all the geopolitical implications of these kind of things now here if you look at the question guys so straight away you know the ben gurion is not about the black sea not about the aegean sea so this is wrong and strait of bab al mandab is also wrong because gulf of oman gulf of persian gulf you have the strait of hormuz i told you the strait of bab al mandab is connecting the red sea to the uh, gulf of aden guys so this is wrong only one is correct three is correct answer is only two again tough question because it's a map based question it's a fact based question you really have to be good about it take a risk only only if you are sure otherwise better to skip rather than taking an, uh, but but i would say the all the options are quite famous i will i will i'm not saying that these are some difficult levels because if you look at the water bodies personally all of the water bodies are very much in use and every water body and is quite popular so i do not see problem coming to you giving the answer so that way is supposed to be easy but since it's a map based question for an average student that's why i'm telling it a little bit difficult one guys now you have the next question coming on the imec india middle east europe economic corridor yes sir what statement is correct you need to look at that guys and you you know that this india middle east uh, middle east europe economic corridor was also the brain child of g20 the g20 that happened in india also uh, announced this new project it was announced the recent uh, g20 summit 
so what is this IMEC you need to know everything about it rating wise I am going to give it a four star rating out of five giving the importance definitely very important topic that you may be encountering in your upcoming exam so talking about the IMEC guys look at the name India it is going to connect India to the Middle East especially the Saudi Arabia and that particular portion from there it is going to connect Europe especially the Greece part right it is going to connect the so Greece is going to be our gateway uh, you know the Greek is going Greece is going to be the gateway to the Europe for us so this particular and and I, I would recommend you guys also uh, look at look at the map of this because you have so many important ports that it connects and you may have question coming on that as well so India Middle East Europe economic corridor it's a proposed economic corridor which aims to enhance the connectivity and enhance the economic integration among the Asia Middle East and Europe and since it is going to connect these three points it is absolutely considered to be encountering the China's BRI Belt Road Initiative because China's BRI also tried to connect from China wants to connect Middle East and then go to Europe so it is absolutely considered to be a rival of the BRI that is that that has the same route to connect guys so Indian ports here that are going to get the most of the benefit this is absolutely important for the exam so in India you have the Mundra port the Kandla port the Deen Dayal port in Gujarat even the JNPT of Navi Mumbai all these ports are going to get the benefit especially the you can say in nutshell the ports of Gujarat and Maharashtra they are going to get the maximum benefit of this particular corridor guys remember during G20 summit it was announced and after this was announced you have got certain uh, certain members of it as well so you're talking about the members who are who are uh, willingly to work on this corridor you have the names like Saudi Arabia European Union India UAE France Germany Italy US all of them have signed and clearly Turkey and Oman are not the members of this IMEC remember who are the member who are not the member and you have the the picture in front of you let me tell you guys do expect questions coming on on the on these uh, connecting ports like you have look like you have in Gujarat in Mumbai do focus on the ports called Jabal Ali that belongs to UAE and similarly you have uh, another port of UAE called as the Al Guwafet that both belongs to UAE with respect to Saudi Arabia you have the ports like Riyadh you have the port like Harad and you have another port uh, called the Al Hadith in Israel you have the port Haifa all these are important cities and important ports which are going to get connected by this particular corridor and in Greece like I told you the Greece is going to be the gateway for us clearly Turkey is not a part of this so why it is going to be a member as well so here the Greece uh, port is called the Pyrus port which is going to be the connecting gateway and from there we are looking to tap the markets of Europe guys okay absolutely important now uh, another yes it's, it's going to be multimodal guys this corridor is going to be multimodal as you can see you are going to use the ship network you are going to use the rail network so it's going to be multimodal uh, which is going to supplement the existing infrastructure of that particular route guys and also it has it has the two corridors you see the whole of the IMAC is actually has the two sub parts sub components of the two corridors from India to the Middle East this is going to be called as the Eastern corridor of this economic corridor and from Saudi to uh, Europe it is going to be called as the Northern corridor so these are the two sub components uh, under which it is going to be formulated or going to be established guys so clearly you, you look at the question you have the answer in front of you the first and three being correct the second is wrong because it says even the Turkey and Oman are the member they are not the members so here you eliminate option number two so you have options only one and two so in that case you can at least take a risk even the question is kind of medium level but here the right answer is going to be B so I do not see any problem coming because it's a very straightforward question very expected expected level of uh, uh, questions and statements with respect to IMSE if you are prepared with it or not that is up to you so I would really recommend you guys read every development with respect to the G20 absolutely important for the upcoming exam 
Question number 15 that we have guys, question 15 is about the O and DC. You remember the first few tests we, al we already have discussed about it once. So open network digital commerce, you know about it, we have, we have read about it n number of times. So talking about the O and DC, the open network digital commerce, which statements are correct that you have to figure out. Okay, so let's, let's learn about it and then we'll come back to the question. What is this O and, o and DC guys? As the name says open network, okay, remember this keyword. The two keywords are here. One keyword is called open network. What is an open network? Open networks are those softwares or those platforms which are not controlled by one particular you know, group. That is an open network. And every individual has an option to customize that software according to their needs. That are open softwares. Open networks are not going to be controlled by few players. They are going to be a democratic network. Digital commerce, I really mean e-commerce kind of e-commerce that we have. Now what is, now considering the two, what is supposed to be ONDC? It's a first of its kind initiative that wants to democratize digital commerce, reduce the dominance of the online retail giants like Amazon, Flipkart and all that. So right now what happens? You are a consumer. You want to order a book or you want to order some furniture or whatever, right? Here is your seller. You are the consumer. But between you and the seller, you have this platform on the app that you are using, right? So you are using the uh, Amazon app or the Flipkart app. So in between the consumer and the seller, you have these platforms and they are going to control, they are going to have a larger control how the product is going to be bought or going to be sold out. Now if you want to, and because of that, there is a kind of monopoly that we have or kind of a centralized control over the buying selling experience. If you want to remove this dominance, you are going to replace the platforms with the open networks. So between the consumer and the seller, you are not going to see what happens. Normally, you can buy only those options which are registered on the Amazon or the Flipkart. There are other sellers also which are not registered. Maybe they are going to give you better product at a, at a, at a better, better price. So here, using the open network, a consumer has wide range of options. You are not you are not going to be compelled to be to buying the products from only those uh, uh, sellers which are there on Amazon. You have a wider option. You have a wider base, and that's why you can get the best product at a, at a most affordable prices, right? So that is the whole idea of replacing the platform centric model with the network centric models like ONDC where buyer seller can interact with each other in a platform agnostic manner in a real time manner. That is the idea. And when it comes to the ministry who is all organizing it, it is the initiative. The ONDC is the initiative of the Department of Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade called DPIT under Ministry of Commerce and Industry. It is incorporated as a private non-profit company. Both these informations are very important for the MCQ. One, it is under Ministry of Commerce. Number two, it's a private non-profit company where the aim is simple to streamline the transaction between buyers and sellers irrespective of the platforms. And that actually explains the objective of the NDC. What we are going to do? Pro objectives of the ONDC means democratize and decentralize the whole e-commerce space, making the things more inclusive, more accessible for the sellers Increase choice and independence of the consumers, making goods and services cheaper because you have the more competition, the prices are going to be more competitive. That is the whole idea. And very similarly, on the lines of the UPI, the way just like UPI enables the smooth money transfers across diverse platforms, doesn't matter you are using the UPI, doesn't matter you are paying to Bharat Pay or Phone Pay or any other Google Pay, there's a smooth interaction, a smooth uh, payment across all the platforms. The same idea we are incorporating in ONDC, where we want to enable smooth transaction between the buyer and seller across all the platforms. No need to be dependent on one platform. Clear guys? So if you look at the question here, you will find all the three answers, all the three statements absolutely correct. Answer is three, all the three are correct. This question, I would say medium one, but some, something you could have attempted very easily, guys. Even looking at the keywords, the keywords can help you a lot. The open network and digital commerce. If you look at the two, you are still in a position
to attempt this question. Sometimes you do not know the detail, but sometimes the keywords can help you figure out the question in the most reasonable manner, right? That brings us to the next question called Swam. Swam plus portal, it's a straight fact based question, guys. Swam portal, Swam plus portal belongs to Ministry of Education. Simple, easy, straightforward question without any trouble. What is this, what is this uh, uh, Swam plus platform? I'll explain you guys. So basically the Swam portal, the Swam plus portal, I, I, I should say, it, it belongs to Ministry of Education. What is a Swam plus platform? It is a platform which is designed to offer employability, designed to offer professional development focused courses which are developed collaboratively with the industrial experts. If you really want to get, become employable, if you really want to be having some professional skills, then you can go and learn those skills from the Swam Plus portal. Got, it, got my point? And that is why this Swam Plus portal right now is offering the programs in sectors like manufacturing, energy, computer science, engineering, management studies, healthcare, hospitalities, and tourism and so and so much so forth. So basically this Swam Plus platform of Ministry of Education is all about offering more employability, making people more professional, uh, uh, making them more developed in professions. And it is the IIT Madras that will be operating this Swam Plus platform. And all the courses which are offered through the Swam Plus, they will be accredited and developed in collaboration with all the reputed industrial houses along as per the guidelines of the UGC and everything else. Okay, this is absolutely important guys. I hope things are clear up to this point. If the things are clear, that brings us to the question number 17 guys. Question number 17 is about the Pradhan Mantri Matsya Kisan Smriti Sa Yojana. As the name says Matsya, Matsya is all about the fisheries. So one thing is clear that the scheme is with respect to the fisheries. But that is not enough. That is not enough to decode the whole uh, uh, to decode whole the answers. So we need to know a little bit more about the Pradhan Mantri Matsya Kisan Smriti Sahyojana and uh, what exactly we have to figure out. Let's learn about it. Okay, so talking about the Pradhan Mantri Matsya Yojana guys, uh, it is going to be implemented as a central sector scheme. This is the very important keyword. It is not a central sponsored one. It's a central sector sub scheme means the states are absolutely not going to have any burden of funding. It is the central government that is going to bear the cost, but not alone, of course. Here, there is a, pro, there is a provision. The 50% funding is to, be, is to uh, come from the public finance, means from the central government, including some of the funding coming from the World Bank as well. And along with the World Bank, it, we have the agencies, Frank, Frank Kaisa, D development, even that is going to be given, giving us some funding. But the remaining 50% of the funding is expected to be coming from the private sector. So you can see this is actually a PPP project where we are expecting the private and the public money both coming. And within public money, states don't have to bear any cost, the central government, but along with the association of the funding coming from the World Bank and other agencies. Why? why this particular scheme was launched what are, what are the components of the scheme so this scheme talks about all the obvious things formalization of the fishery sector we want to adopt aquaculture insurance so to have more insurance in, in, in the aquaculture sector supporting the micro enterprises because majority of the fisheries today in india they are working as an unorganized sector they are working as informal sector and that is why you have lots and lots of micro enterprises involved indulged in the fishery sector and we want to we really want to make these fishery sector adopt and expand the safety and quality assurance system to make it more formal to make it more commercial and that's why these kind of schemes are needed when it comes to um, the, the duration of the project it is going to be implemented for a four year plan from 2022 23 24 it is going to expand till 26 27 and it is going to be given to all the states and all the union territories and when it comes to enterprises to formalize the fishery sector uh, and supporting the micro small medium enterprises of the fisheries 
investments of over 6000 crores over the next four years are going to come in this particular sector everything is fine everything is perfect um, about the scheme so if you have to figure out the correct one of course you first need to eliminate this one it says central sponsored they are not central sponsored they are central sector scheme so state government need not to have any botheration is it about the three years guys you just have learned with me the scheme is for four years going to go till 26 27 so clearly not my case then it says the the project is completely funded by central government no sir you have the provisions you have the funding coming by world bank and other afd kind of institutions so not purely funding funded by central government so here the options are correct the third one very obvious if even if you look at from this perspective even if you are not in a position to eliminate the other ones you can still get to the right answer as option c why just imagine why this particular yojana what with what objective you can think of any yojana like that the answer is very pretty obvious any such yojana is about formalizing the fishery sector supporting the small farmers small fishermen right investing this much money in the next four years and when it says look at this this great deal when the question itself says next four years obviously the next three is going to be wrong so you just have to read the statements carefully and you can very easily you will be in a position to figure out that yes sir there is some problem which is there and of course it is how can it be fully funded because you you just have learned 50 percent funding is to be done by private sector also so clearly the answer is c in this case question level i would say yes sir it was a medium level question but something you can take a little bit of risk and could have attempted this question and majority of the students can attempt it without any trouble in this case brings us to the question number 18 sir question about operation greens what is operation green and what we need to learn about the operation green scheme first let's learn then we'll come back so for operation green you really have to go back to few years back this operation green has its origin in the union budget of 1819 and the way we have operation flood on the similar lines of operation flood we have got the operation green it is a central sector scheme all the funding by central government and the scheme was actually announced under the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada Yojana scheme. Please remember the ministries are 95% the ministries are going to be wrong in the paper. So very careful with the ministries. When it comes to the Operation Green, it is going to be the nodal ministry will be Ministry of Food Processing Industry. So please remember it is not Ministry of Agriculture. It is the Ministry of Food Processing Industries where, where this whole scheme of the Operation Green and PM Kisan Sampada has two components. One is short term intervention that we are doing under this Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada Yojana. The short term invention, intervention by the government is with respect to the price stabilization. And the second one called the long term interventions by the government is all about the value chain development you see when you when you have to go with the long term intervention it is always going to be integrated value chain development short term is about the price stabilizations why this operation green scheme is so significant why because it enhances the value realization of the farmers it minimizes the post harvest loss of the farmers and that's why increase their income and it exclusively tries to minimize the post harvest loss of at least 22 perishable crops that we have. Statement number four again is important because this operation green scheme of course it, it promotes the farmer producer organization FPOs and it also enhances the agricultural logistics processing facilities professional agri produce management why it produce why because ultimately everything is a part of a supply chain because if you are not promoting the fpo the logistics part and the markets and everything of course you are not going to increase the value of the supply chain so so this you need to remember a lot but the only problem with this case was the ministry as you have just learned it is not the ministry of agriculture number two is wrong it is ministry of food processing that is taking care of the pm sampada yojana 
and the operation green scheme under that so clearly my three answers are correct one is wrong but i would not say this was an easy question guys it was a tough question why it's a it's a fact oriented question it's a fact oriented if it is a central sector scheme or a central uh, sponsor scheme you can't really guess is it really about 22 crops the number i can't predict the logic i can predict but what about the number makes sense so in this case better to skip this question if you are not familiar with it because you really do not have much scope and again the the ministries are going to trouble you a lot that is for sure so be very careful with this kind of question guys that takes us to the question number 19 which is about the kilkari scheme kilkari is uh, you know like like the newborn babies when they when they say something that is called that is called kilkari right so kilkari scheme so what we need to know about it let's let's try to get into that so recently uh, the kilkari project expanded to include maharashtra and gujarat now in total 20 states and union territories of india there we have got the kilkari project not all so be careful if some sometimes question says that kilkari has become a pan india project it is still not because it is still only 20 states and uts where we have the kilkari project kilkari is the baby's gurgle that we that we say uh, in hindi so kilkari is actually a centralized interactive voice response the ivr interactive voice response based mobile health service we started way back in 2016 and look at this beautiful and very important scheme what exactly this kilkari scheme is doing you just need to have a you just need need to have a mobile in front of you so any pregnant lady any new mother in our country they are going to get the essential health information on their mobile so every week time appropriate audio messages with respect to pregnancy maternal health neonatal health the child birth child care these kind of audio messages and that to free of cost is going to be delivered to the mother the pregnant lady and the newborn new newly mother, uh, become mothers and directly it is going to come onto your mobile phone so as to encourage informed choices so as to encourage healthy choices of the newborn care M maternal care can be done better the newborn care can be done better and for that purpose we have got the kilkari scheme but please remember the ministry this scheme kilkari scheme i know it's a tech based scheme but the the core objective is about the health of mother and baby and that is why the ministry of health and family welfare are the right ministries to pick for this so clearly the option number 2 is wrong it is not the ministry of electronics it's the ministry of health and family welfare where we have so option 1 is correct number 2 is not correct guys so in this case a is the right answer so yes medium level question you you can take a risk but be very careful with the ministries first statement is quite right and you can still attempt it without any trouble okay sir so next last question we have got is with respect to the national council for transgender persons the nctp what we need to know about this council very very important guys so what is this national council for the transgender person nctp is a statutory body fact number 1 to remember it is primarily concerned with advising the government about all the policy matters that affect the transgender and intersex persons of this country holding the rights of lgbtq it was established way back in 2020 under the provisions of transgender person protection of the rights act 2019 so you clearly can sense the scheme the whole scheme is about the social justice isn't it guys it is about giving social justice to the transgender people of this country so what ministry it is it has to be ministry of social justice and empowerment that lead this council make sense guys so very important scheme of social justice here you have both statements are correct without any trouble without any body and i think this was an easy question you could have attempted without even much of the knowledge because you the name itself is self explanatory you have this council it's a transgender person council it's a statutory body because it is under act of parliament so yeah very easy to guess answer is supposed to be um, c in this particular case so i hope you have enjoyed the first 20 set of questions if you did 
do let me know in the comment section box how you rate our video discussions do let me in the comment section box and i'm really really curious that you guys are practicing or not all the mcqs which are required at this stage guys please boost up your preparation last 60 days are make or break kind of point do not waste a single minute now it's a high time where you have to uh, consolidate all your preparation that you have done with so much of blood and sweat so get on get on to the preparation of the upsc get yourself in the fighting mode all my best wishes. See you guys with the part number two very, very soon. Till then, best wishes. Take care. God bless you. Jai.